Institute that specializes in training and coaching mid-career professionals and business teams through digital innovation and customer eccentric expert expertise. And with that, I would also like to thank our community partner, SCAPE. SCAPE is a nonprofit organization with its mission and vision rooted in support of youth, talent, and leadership development. We also would like to thank our F&B partner, Rain, an online restaurant that is improving lives through meaningful food experiences. And I would like to thank Singapore Design Council, because this is a community event of the Singapore Design Week. So to kick off our session for the future of design education, I would like to call on the founder and general manager of Curse Corps to welcome us all with his opening speech, Dylan Song. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Thank you so much for being here and with us. Uh, I'm Dylan. I'm the founder of Curious Core. And uh, we started this company about three years ago. Uh, so we're relatively new. And this is our first pop-up campus event. So uh, thanks for being a part of this uh, today. So all our guests, uh, kind sponsors from Skate, as well as ladies and gentlemen, thanks for being with us tonight. Uh, my team and I are delighted that you choose to face us this evening, at the end of the work week. And the Curious Call Pop Up Campus is the first in person public event we organized since COVID 19, and we are glad to be one of the first few events that kickstart the Singapore Design Week uh, 2022. So today we are one step closer to having our vision uh, of having a physical campus. Uh, we've been operating at a, as a virtual campus uh, thus far uh, in the last three years. So this is our two-day pop-up event. So why Design Week? Prior to starting Curious Call in 2020, I visited many design festivals around the world and in different countries purely out of curiosity as a local design graduate in Singapore. And it has always been a dream of mine to uplift opportunities within the design community. First, with co-organizing Singapore back in 2012, and then eventually teaching at the local polytechnics and universities. So, uh, and it's true talking to my students and learning more about the education industry that I saw an opportunity to help creatives to earn a higher income and be able to also pluck the talent shortages in the tech community itself. So I'm glad we are on the trajectory towards growth this year, uh, starting with our anchor client in Malaysia, where uh, we are helping them with their training needs in user experience design and product management uh, with Nexus Telecommunications. Um, so competing as a small startup hasn't been the easiest. Uh, we are in a market with many established players uh, and the government offers a lot of highly discounted options as well. So, uh, but I think it's a lot easier because we have the support of many of our uh, industry partners, including our guest instructors, which are here with us today. And obviously from the team as well. So uh, the team has spent the last couple of weeks uh, uh, trying to put up this event. We are also thankful for our alumni and without them uh, we would not have as many uh, referrals as we do and we often have a lot of referrals coming in true because of our alumni uh, promoting our programs. So thank you for referring your friends, uh, alumni, and you guys are truly the early adopters and early majority in our product market fit. Um, I'd like to especially thank um, our initial students, uh, including Charlene, Ivy, Logas, Michelle, Cindy, Wenxian, our first customers. And this year, we managed to expand our learning vertical to the discipline of product management. 
So my first professional discipline in tech uh, is not UX design, but actually as a product manager. And uh, I'm heartened that we have clients like GIC and Shopee believing us enough that they uh, actually send their employees to our programs uh, to train their new and junior pro project managers and program managers to be product managers. Uh, and I believe at the heart of what we do is about listening to our customers and really understanding what's needed from the industry itself. Uh, so I'm glad to share with you that we would be offering more career support programs uh, in Q4 2022 uh, because we know that many people who go through other courses, they don't get the necessary career support that they require uh, in order to transition into the tech industry. We know it can be downright scary and we wish to be your guide and your coach in this process. So just a brief idea, uh, we're looking to actually do a two-day workshop eventually uh, where there will be a resume audit, um, tips on storytelling, including presenting yourself better, as well as the Gallup uh, Finder to actually help you identify your strengths uh, and communicate them better to your prospective employers. To compete more effectively in the local market, we are also in the midst of securing approval from WSQ uh, for our UX and product management programs. So that means that learners who want to pursue our courses full time are most, uh, and we'll be making more announcements in the coming quarter. Lastly, I would like to thank Benjamin, Taufik, Iwe, and Juliana from the Skate Headquarters team. Uh, who is very helpful in putting up the proposal for us to secure this event venue uh, from the skate management team, our food sponsor, Green, and as well as uh, in growing the company and offering their co-working space at a much subsidized rate to us in the last one and a half years. Uh, we have finally graduated uh, from the co-working space uh, as we're going to look for our office uh, in November 2022, uh, in having an actual physical campus uh, that's that's uh, that's not as big, but it's a it's a start. So I'm also looking forward to working with you all in the coming months as we bring as a tech like digital skills academy. Uh, as a favor, I uh, if you see any of my team members who are wearing the organizer badge please give them a high five or a pat on the back later uh, because they have worked tirelessly in the last few weeks to make this happen. So good vibes only and stay curious, everyone. High five, high five. <laughs> Thank you so much, David. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm about to get theory-eyed for the appreciation and exciting things ahead for Curious Court. Thank you so much for being part of our first uh, ever pop-up campus. And now let's move on to the main event, which is our panel discussion. But before that, let me introduce to you who our moderator is for tonight. My apologies. We will have our keynote speech first before our panel discussion. Um, but nonetheless, I will still introduce to you our very handsome moderator for today, Jay Delapio. And um, a little background on Jay. Jay is a UX and visual designer who has worked with some amazing talent and projects at Twitter, Pinterest, Yahoo, and Grab. He's worked on notable projects such as the Bay Lights, Gaspar Brasserie, San Francisco's Park System, SF Park, Grab Food, and various Grab safety features from facial recognition to telematics for drivers. Jay was also an adjunct professor at California College of the Arts in San Francisco, California, and has taught, taught design and typography classes at universities and high schools all around China. For ECG. That is all welcome, Jay Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. 
All right, so let's get on with the program tonight. Thank you for that uh, amazing speech, Dylan, and thank you for that warm introduction. So today I'll be introducing Tomas, uh, and Dr. Tomas McNamee is a design researcher, educator, interested in how people use technology to learn, communicate, and play. Specifically, his current research focuses on conversational design, digital innovation, and entrepreneurship. He's an associate professor of communication management at SMB, uh, and currently he teaches user experience design, design thinking, market innovation based on his decade-long industry experience in Silicon Valley uh, companies such as Netflix, Microsoft, and several startups. So Thomas, I'm going to let you take it away with your keynote speech. Thanks, Jay, and thank you very much, Dalen, and the entire Curious Core team for inviting me. Um, I'm very honored. So I uh, will try to advance my own slides here, so bear with me. Okay, so I thought that this might be a great opportunity to have a good discussion about design education. So I am not Singaporean. I know it's hard to tell. Okay? But I would very much um, I've been coming here eight, nine years for work. We previously have been living here for the past three years, and as an educator for the last two years at SMU full time. And I was very, very curious about um, how design is developing here in this country, and how does that compare to the global trends that we're seeing all across the world. So I thought that hopefully it will be uh, <clears throat> a good reason for you guys to listen to me. What I I think I can speak to design education here in Singapore, uh, despite the fact of not being from this land. Okay? So here's what I had in my mind of why you might be wanting to listen to this, to this whole uh, speech for the next 15, 20 minutes. So you might be already a designer, right? You might already be a professional, a design professional who is interested in hearing trends, who is, you know, a, Star as Jay and many others in the audience were doing this for a long, long time and want to continue to pick up new trends, continue to expand your horizon. So that may be one segment of the audience. Then I thought there might be professors amongst us, as of you have seen Money Heist, right? That's the professor uh, in, in the show, right? So there might be educators, uh, teachers, professors, private uh, educators, and organizations that they, who also are interested in placing themselves in a growing and, and excitingly changing landscape of design education here in, in Singapore. Um, and there might be some folks who either are students or want to be students or want to be students again um, of design and they want to learn more about design. So hopefully that is also a, could be of interest to you. And then finally, there are some of us who are just curious, right, to the core and, and want to know what the heck is this uh, you know, design education really all about and look like. So that's kind of what I had in mind uh, for, for tonight's uh, 20 minutes of introduction. I, I promise not to get over, but Jay, I asked Jay here to uh, keep me to my promise. So if at, at 7 o'clock you still see me here, then drag me down or turn off the mic, okay? So. But in that 20 minutes, what I, uh, what I had in mind, and actually coming from three sources, I have the privilege and the pleasure to sit on a few design uh, committees here in Singapore um, and advise some of the organizations, including the government. And one of the, these uh, organizations is the Design uh, Education Advisory Committee, DEAC, is where in Singapore and everything has to have an acronym uh, and an abbreviation. So DEAC uh, is, is a group of individuals from the, the education sector and the uh, practitioners coming together to advance a new vision for how design education in Singapore should look like. So I had the privilege of joining this, uh, this group and they, they just published their second report um, that you see up here. So I will be bringing some insights from that report to you that hopefully you are interested and relevant for the conversation will follow. My second source and inspiration is a piece I wrote actually with my wonderful and amazing co-author, a, a, a grad uh, person. Uh, so so Darani Carrera is, is my uh, co-author on this one and we presented this paper at a recent UX 
uh, conference, so at Kai, those of you who were for Kai, um, we had um, a separate workshop on Southeast Asia uh, education, uh, HCI, community human interaction in US education. The paper is still in press, so we won't be able to find it. We're finalizing the, the publishing, but as soon as it happens, I will definitely pass it on to Bailey. You can, uh, you can have a read. And that, so this is going to be my second source of inspiration about the conversation for, for this evening. And the third is really just my own experience as both a designer, a design researcher, um, uh, throughout a decade or so in, uh, in the US, and uh, coming here and, and working with, with folks uh, here in Singapore. All right, so these are my inspirations, my sources, uh, essay, and your life is probably first everything you don't like coming all right, <clears throat> so let's go back in history. Let's look at how the design education sector and design education uh, evolved here in Singapore. And this was a fascinating read for me as well, of course, uh, to understand and, and learn the history of this very young country and how the design education uh, is where we are today. So it actually all started, believe it or not, in 1958. Um, at, at the Singapore Polytechnic. It's the first institution that offered officially a course in architecture. That's how, where we gave back the first organizational um, uh, traces of design uh, education here in this country. So that's the first one, it's architecture, right? The second one is actually a few years later um, that, we, that, that we all refer to ECB, right? The, the ED, EDB, sorry, another acronym. So the Economic Development Board um, put out, uh, it was established, they created it in 1965, and put out straight away a campaign for, for brands and products called to promote Singapore locally made and locally designed brands and products, which is what Made in Singapore campaign uh, is, and it's still today. Happening and sponsored by the Similarly, um, the Trade Development Board Association, TED, uh, also was, was supporting these efforts back in the, in the mid 60s. All right, so that's sort of the second step of how design got re woven into the fabric of the society from an institutional uh, standpoint. All right, so then the first institution that was actually dedicated to design was the Baharudin Vocational Institute, the BVI. It's very interesting. I, I, I'm sure many of you know that's in Queenstown, so the building, the old, uh, institute's uh, building is, is still there. And they were focusing on things like fashion. They were focusing on uh, ads, art, uh, printing, woodworking, and all of these elements, and they were the first institu institution who really offered, you know, beyond the architectural uh, track, additional design components. So you can you can find a couple of very interesting uh, uh, images from from the era in the, in the National Art Museum. Okay, so we're in 1968, right? Um, then really, and uh, this is uh, this is a. A big learning for somebody who's not, who hasn't gone through the senior for education, uh, how the, I cannot overemphasize the importance of polytechnics uh, here with regards to design, because that is where all design education started. And through these years from the 60s, mid 60s uh, onwards, uh, design education lived in the realm of polytechnics. Okay? Up until very recently, only when, when uh, Congress universities and other organizations also started to offer various design courses, they all lived in the polytechnics. So what we, what we have today and the professionals who've been trained throughout the decades coming out from, from that realm, from that source, all right? So super interesting <clears throat> and to, to see that. And by today, we are very fortunate to have to be able to say that through the polytechnics and now through the autonomous universities and private organizations like Curious for contributing to arms of design, all right? So, so oftentimes my students also ask like, 
hey, you teach you apps, you teach design thinking and all of that, but how does that connect to fashion? How does that connect to architecture, to graphic design? So a very helpful framework for those of you uh, who haven't had a chance to think about this is to delineate into four different brackets design. So think of the first one as, uh, as something that we can call the placemaking design, right? So that group of, uh, of disciplines create places. The most typical and most logical of such is architecture, right? Architecture, but similarly interior design, right? Or, uh, or garden uh, you know, uh, design, or, or play, uh, design disciplines that create spaces. So that's the first one. The second one is really going into uh, industrial design. When you create ob physical objects. So that's the second design discipline. Interior design is a good example, uh, but product design as well as fashion falls into the second uh, design category. Right? The third design category that I, I, I'm putting out here where the convincing are is the visual when you create graphics or images, right? the outcome is about the visual modality primarily. So the classical art design falls over there, graphic design falls over here, anything that creates those visual uh, images. Okay? And then finally, the fourth category, and, and that's probably getting closer to, to what uh, we're here to, to this evening, is about experience or service design. So experience design is, uh, some would argue, the latest addition to the design family is all about creating those that allows us to interact digitally or otherwise, analog, with, uh, with the things and the services around us. So UI, UX design squarely fit into this bracket, uh, as well as service design, creating experiences, UX research or design research, as we like, as we like to call it, uh, and design strategy all fall into this fourth, fourth bracket of design or experience design. So the recap is we make places, objects, graphics, and experiences, okay? So we are very fortunate actually here because uh, the fourth category, this, uh, this experience design, which UX is also part of it, actually started much later. So the origins can be traced back you know, in this country about the 80s, early 80s, where I was super happy to find this uh, document uh, from the, again, Singapore uh, National Archives. And it was an initiative to, uh, to promote. There was this very optimistic and bold statement coming out from, uh, from, from the government offices about this phenomenon, okay, that computer and software professionals are needed. In 1980, this report stated that, that currently we're in the country employ about 850 uh, computer professionals in this country, okay? And there is this bold vision that within the next couple of years, by 1990, okay, this number might rise to about 1,800, maybe 2,000, okay? So that, that was, that's how the humble start of this fourth arm of design, experience design, education, and, and computer UX design started. And Singapore is not, not unique in that sense. Uh, and the rest of the UX and HCI human computer interaction really started out from this small, tiny, typically computer science departments of universities in a small underground basement and, and dungeons, really, of campuses, where they taught this uh, random sounding uh, discipline called human factors engineering. And it, it was really falling under the category of computer scientists, of nerds who just hang out and, and measuring things, you know, anything from how do we, um, how do we operate machinery. Started actually, it's not, not random that I, I picked an image from NASA. It started in, in the military and in, and in engineering uh, of operating uh, uh, you know, airplanes, and radar controls, and how can we make sure that the people who are watching the radar controls don't fall asleep. A lot of attention research grew out of it, and psychology was also developed. But the people who were more interested how the humans, the, 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 the machinery themselves, started to look at this in a methodical way 
uh, about human computer interaction. Okay? And that's how human factors then became into, into the founding discipline. What later on in the 2000s, we would, we would teach, well, at university, we still teach this because we live like at least 20 years behind. But here, this is what we, what we always say, like, you know, UX, as you see, user experience, encompasses all these other fields and disciplines, including human factors, the origins, but grew into and incorporated some visual uh, elements, some architecture, interaction design, HCI, all these different fields uh, of disciplines that started to interact. And we started a journey, globally as well as here in Singapore, and you start off with a single discipline, right? In this, in this case, human, human factors engineering. Then you reach a next stage where now we have multidisciplinary fields, right? So these, these multiple disciplines work together to some extent, or at least coexist, and we learn tidbits from each other, but still not working as closely as we would like. All right, so fast forward to today, you can actually, uh, you know, very happy to, 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 to notice this and we did the, the entire survey on this, that all 14 institutes of higher learning, IHLs, I'm picking up the lingo in three years, so the acronyms. So 14 IHLs, all of them offer some degree of human computer interaction UX courses. Okay, starting and, and we branched out from the original, you know, source uh, of the polys, now all the uh, autonomous, autonomous universities, as well as the two um, institutes of art uh, and ITE, uh, all offer to some degree some kind of uh, UX and UCI related, experience design related courses. Um, it's no, uh, it's not a uh, random fact that I'm not saying that, that they all offer some unified, uh, holistic, uh, holistic uh, curriculum and syllabus because it doesn't exist yet. And right? I'll come to that in just a second from now. Now I want to start looking towards the future. Okay, why would someone be interested in this field? What do I tell my students, and I'm sure other educators as well get this question a lot, as well as in your, in your, in your practitioner and your mentor students, and they ask, you know, why should I study this, this field? Uh, well, here's one uh, reason for it, for example. So there was a, a national study here in, in Singapore conducted in 2019, 2020, and the latest edition of 21, 22 is in press, so we've seen the results of it, we're just not uh, allowed to share it yet, um, of what do we anticipate are those design disciplines that will generate the greatest growth and will be needed for this country. Remember that original 1980 paper where I said we're, we're going, growing from 850 to about, to about uh, you know, 1,500, 2,000 people? Guess what? Now we're anticipating that there are, and you can read it if you want, about 85,000 design professionals okay, will be in the workforce by 2025. That's a huge jump. Okay? So that's why you would see all the IHLs across the island working vigorously to, to help these, uh, the, the, to fill the needs of the workforce, but we cannot do it alone. That's why we need Dylan, that's why we need Clear's Core and other of these institutions to help fill this, uh, this ongoing demand of jobs. Interesting uh, categories here that, that you know, um, I always point to as my students. They ask me like, what should I, what should I study? What should I aim for? And I, and I show this graph to them and you can see how experience design, you know, business design strategists, content strategies, PMs, and design research are the hot top five skills and areas that one would, um, one would want to study in order to be competitive and, and have job prospects here in this country in the coming five years. Okay? Uh, all of these are indicated the resources. You can look, you look up yourself and, and read it. Fascinating reading. So in addition to the specific needs, what are the what are the skills that one should pick up to get those jobs, to be good at those jobs? All right. And I turned to the World Economic Forum and, and the WEF put out uh, a nice report where they say the workplace. What skills are needed 
um, for the future workplace to be uh, successful. And they pointed out um, these competencies, these skills that are really being needed for the future. And essentially the top 10 skills, if you read this report, seven out of those 10 skills are design related. Because everyone who has touched design can testify that critical thinking and analysis, check. Problem solving, a lot. Self-management, all the time. Working with people, 80% of my time, right? Management and communication of activities, oh, that's a lot, right? All of these skills are, are skills that designers do on an everyday basis. So that should be encouraging to you because the future is bright if you are a designer, because you will be needed. That's something that not every industry, and this is because the very same report also mentions that about half of the global population workforce will need to be retrained, <clears throat> will need to change their, their jobs, they will need to change their directions because they will be either made redundant by automation, by AI, and other, uh, and, uh, and other factors, but um, these skills are the ones where you want to put your future uh, chips towards, okay? All right, um, and then finally, before um, I, I, I go into my very last moments, and I'm waiting for Jay to kick me out in two minutes, but uh, uh, finally, uh, I wanted to point out that the DEA, DEAC, this Design Education Advisory Committee that, that has been working very hard for the last two years in creating recommendations for the future of design education here in Singapore. Uh, this is our current point of vision. And we're working towards to create initiatives, prototypes, ideas, working together with the, with the polytechnics, the, the institutions uh, of higher learning, IHLs, and, and other places where students come to learn these skills. So uh, the, the not the, the the, the, the ambitious goal there to create a globally recognized brand of Singapore design education. And you can see the six pillars here, uh, and they all point to the fact that Singapore is taking design education seriously, that we need to take actions on them, and we, on, and on all of these points, and, and we need to grow from where we are, this multidisciplinary, to a next level of design that's often been referred to as design 3.0 and design 4.0. And if you allow me, I want to close with my points of reflection. So observations from personal. Uh, and this is coming from uh, from Durrani and, and myself sitting down, uh, virtually unfortunately, but uh, definitely a lot of wine included. And let's see what do we see from, from, perspective, from our own perspectives, both from an education standpoint and from an industry standpoint, and reflect on what is happening in Singapore. So the first point I want to point out is there is a need to move beyond this multidisciplinary uh, design aspect, right? Where remember human factors, interaction design, architecture, visual design, they all sort of interact and we chip here and there from each other. But we need more. We need to really integrate these different fields. We need to learn from each other. And this is where we see a great opportunity for industry to come and shape that discourse. This is where you start to see design disciplines popping up in a weird way at a business school. What does a, a design folk do, the, do at, at the business school? I don't have a business background, right? But I'm, I, I'm in the business school teaching designs for a bunch of uh, designers, a bunch of students who don't want to be designers, but they are going to be the future PMs. They're going to be the future CEOs. And if I don't catch them early, they're not going to have that human-centric uh, perspective that I'd like them to have. All right? So first, uh, reflection and observation. Second, the design as a function exists. And I want to celebrate that fact. If you go to organizations today in Singapore, you would find actually more and more of them having this hunger for talent and trying to attract often foreign talent because there is still a lack of uh, locally, domestically grown talent. Um, and that's why uh, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to work hard to create those locally grown and, and locally uh, taught uh, talent because there's a growing need to celebrate that fact. 
Um, what uh, is an additional importance is that it's not only the, the designers who create, but designers who, uh, who, who bring insights. So design research is an important element, getting more and more recognition. While it's not firmly integrated into the process, it, it's, into the good, it's, a, it's a step towards the right direction. The design research and user insights are needed. Fourth is HCI, however, is still seen as a downstream uh, function, right? Where uh, designers create UIs, researchers create insights, and we just sort of pass it around and have the decision makers uh, explain and do something with those insights, with those UIs, which is going to be my fifth point, and uh, I believe the penultimate that it's not seen, design leadership is not taken to, to the core of the table. We still don't have a seat at, at those conversations. Like most companies work to do to move design into those leadership conversations and have them uh, be, be part of those. Um, and another thing is that HCI and design is still only seen as something where you produce pixels, right? You make those pixels and then make sure that we have a nice digital presence. But design, experience design can offer so much. Your service uh, design, conversations of how experiences really evolve can go way beyond just the, the, the limitation of the digital screen and the digital asset. Um, all right, my final point, I promise, to Jay. My final point is how uh, HCI um, it roles are still very much siloed and very specialized, and they don't have that connection that we really need. So one thing we can do and push forward as designers and uh, as prospective designers is to push and, and grow and connect the additions that all of these disciplines can provide and move from this multidisciplinary design 2.0 interdisciplinary 3.0 and ultimately the transdisciplinary design 4.0. I'll stop here. I thank you very much for uh, allowing me to, to ramble on, on the, how I see design education evolving in this country and I'm looking forward to the conversation with, uh, with you guys. Thanks very much. Awesome, awesome. All right, that was a wonderful uh, lecture by uh, Talas. I, I love, really love the past, present, and future, and the potential of UX design in that talk. That was great. So I guess, without further ado, the main event. So I'd love to have the panelists come up, and uh, come up, and uh, we'll see some very interesting topics in general. So. I'd uh, love to have Dalen, uh, Amida, and Dalen, right? Oh, yeah, tell us, tell us, right. There you are. <laughs> and. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, if you want to sit where your photo is, please go ahead. Um, so. Amita has joined us, and for anyone that, has, that doesn't know who Amita is, uh, Amita Nalare is director at the School of Technology for the Arts at Republic Polytechnic. Oh my gosh, what's going on here? All right, awesome, thank you. Uh, so Amita is director at the School of Technology for the Arts, SDA, at Republic Polytechnic. Uh, she equips students with the expertise needed to enhance the work of expressions in disciplines such as arts, theater management, user experience design, game design, and gamification, and a lot of other things. Welcome, Amita. Nice to have you here. Hi. 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 <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. So we'll move on into the, the panel discussion. If you have questions, we do have a Slido. So if you're online, uh, yeah, here you go. There's a QR code. Feel free to vote up questions, vote down questions, add your own questions. There's a lot of interesting questions up there already. So feel free to, you know, based on when you want to hear from our panelists up here, uh, feel free to ask those questions in general. So uh, without further ado, I guess I'll come sit down and join the panelists up here. So awesome, awesome. So awesome talk, Thomas. I think maybe a toss up. Or, I'm here. 
Um, yeah. So from your perspective, Amita, what is the biggest challenge your students face, especially when they graduate and showcase their portfolio? Okay, um, for just to give you context, my school has got five diplomas that trains students in the creative arts and uh, industry for in many areas of the arts sector, the media sector and the design sector. So they deal with, they learn how to design games, they learn how to uh, design sets for um, arts and theatre, they also do media production, transmedia, uh, content, digital content creation as well as of course UX. Um, so what are the the challenges that the students face. I think the, the like any other graduate who comes out, there's always the fear of um, finding a stable job uh, in the creative industry. Uh, so, you know, the creative industry is such that it's quite largely gig-based, gig-based, project-based, um, you know, and, and, and the challenge is for them to be able to survive and something like that. So um, we always tell our kids, no, you must learn to think horizontally. Horizontally. Don't think of just being a, uh, well, you can be a specialist, but you know your skills are not just limited to the creative industry. It can, your creative skill sets, your design skill set can really spread across if you know how to do it. Great answer. Uh, thank you, Amina. I think that's a good segue into you know potentially partnering with partners, right, to help drive that interest. And also, for you, Thomas, but anyone else can jump in as well. I think uh, when you think it's important to partner with practitioners to drive interest into the education field, again, I, I know this is for you, but also others can also jump in as well. Sure. Uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I love the question. So as, as I mentioned earlier in the, in, in the presentation, I really see the future of, the, of design education moving beyond the silo disciplines of where we are. And, and the exposure that our students can get from industry practitioners who come to our classes, who lead the, the activities, is just invaluable. So I have really exceptional designers come into my own UX class teach Figma, such as Jay, and many others who, who come in and, and, and tell the students that and show them the authenticity. So I, I, I always mention it when I speak is how they shouldn't listen to them. If you just learned it in a book, don't listen to them, okay? Listen to them because they have done it and feel that, that authenticity just shining and running out from them and have, uh, have that learning experience. Awesome. So I think this is related to all of you, uh, and it, it deals with age range, and it also kind of deals, deals with adult education, but this is definitely related. How has the age group of students responded to design education? Do they need more support to jump into the design field? And why? So anyone can take this. I feel like it would be very interesting to start off with you first, Alita. Then tell us and then be like, <laughs> How do they react to? How do they react to or respond to design education, the interest, and potentially jumping into it in the beginning, especially for you? Yeah. Well, I mean, coming from the polytechnic, I think a lot, a lot of students who actually have a creative diploma or a UX design diploma, they, they um, a lot of them will have done design and technology in secondary school. And you know, coming from the MOE education system, DAT is, is gives them the insight of, about design education. Um, but I think in, in the body, uh, we need to inspire them. And, and I picking up on what Tama said about you know authentic learning, it's very important. Um, the age range that I deal with with the kids, the kids are about 17 to 20. They're at this right time of um, wanting to express themselves. You need to open their minds and expose and inspire them with um, uh, that they don't have, they need to think out of the box. You need to free their, um, you know, free their design sensibility. Don't limit them because, and, and you need to expose 
percent in real world, real world examples, real world environments. Talks from industry will definitely help. And uh, getting to them to work in collaborative spirit on problem statements about um, the world around them, about things that they can relate to, starts and can spark off something. And we often we can often, often start with community projects. You know, take them out of the classroom, bring them to the community center or the CDC for that matter. Take them a walking journey, a learning journey around the neighborhood, and then you start to think about, hey. There is no walkway between the MRT station and the bus interchange. And on rainy days in Woodlands, Woodlands rains a lot. They come up with a project, Sharala. Let's share an umbrella. And they, they, they do user experience, they do user um, research. They get to know what there is the need to create that sheltered walkway. But is there a cheaper way to do so? So they came up with uh, an umbrella sharing system. And, and you know, and it's like a pay, pay for the donation, you just pick an umbrella, and now you see it, you do see it apart, right? They pick an umbrella, across the street, they, put, they deposit the umbrella. So I mean, these are interesting, simple solutions, real world. And I tell you, you open your minds, they can just, the floodgates are open and then boom. So 17 to 20, very, very engaging. That's awesome. And now the transition to uni is very interesting. Go ahead. All right, so I understand the logic of why you call this, this disorder. So so yeah, so so continuing the, the we arrived at the university, and we have you is that they are hungry for real world experience. They are hungry for those internships. At SMU and NUS, all of the places, all the universities, they have to do, folks have to do internships. And really the most important question that I can help them with is how do they gain the real world experience, right? It doesn't matter what they learned in the class. It doesn't matter what they do you know, for, for the assignments. What matters is where, where are the places that they're gonna go during those summer months or, or, or winter months um, in their internships. So I, I definitely continuing the, the trend that I'm just started is that that connection to the industry. And so I'm really looking for partners all the time to, to find those internship opportunities for the brightest students and, and everyone who wants that real world experience and get it to them. So from a university standpoint, their biggest need is to gain that experience that prepares them for, for joining the workplace, that, that gives them the competitive edge that in, in the real world uh, places. And then Dalen, how do adult learners in general deal with uh, design education? Thank you, Amita. So for us, uh, we have students anywhere from uh, the early 20s all the way to the uh, early 40s and definitely as adult learners um, a lot of them hold full-time jobs so they really want a very efficient way to learn um, they don't want us to waste any time and they want things to be as practical as possible so when we thought about how we were going to compete in the marketplace looking at all the programs out there um, we wanted to offer something that is as practical as possible so that they can learn in the real world. Um, so we actually offer them like three commercial projects where they can work with actual clients um, in teams and they work remotely during the COVID era. They still work remotely now, so it's very relevant um, in the current workplace. And because they are mostly mid-career, some of them work in the industry for about five years or 10 years. And to them, it's very scary to make that transition into a totally new field like tech. And um, as we know, tech industry has a lot of interview process and uh, it can be quite demanding. So we, we need to be able to help prepare them psychologically and also uh, from a skills perspective, uh, really them for the challenge. So we provide career coaching uh, for them. Um, 
very deliberate level, we ensure that we know how to prepare their portfolio because some of them don't come from a design background, some of them are business accounting graduates, or even, um, you know, like we had a police detective come through our program. So it's, it's, it's a totally different view. So we have to prepare them well uh, in order for, to make the transition successful and meaningful for them. Can I flip the, the, the script here? On the yes. Can I ask you? Jason, so, so you're you're exactly on the receiving end on this on this flow. You 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 know you heard a little bit of the funnel. Yeah. You're on the receiving end of things. So what is it that you need from us? What is it that we're not doing? Oh man. Uh, I love that you put this great. Um, what do I think that education is not doing out here? I think. For my experience, uh, you know, working especially in the U.S. and being a pro here in the U.S., I think it would be nice if the companies out here in Singapore partnered with the universities and the polytechnics a little bit closer. Because, example, right, when I used to teach at CCA, every student show the companies would be there, and there's always the potential for an internship being offered. And it doesn't even, you don't even have to be graduating; you can be a junior, and at least you're making a relationship with. Seeing students, and there's potential to like just connect with an HR company or start off potentially to just learn and have this amazing uh, opportunity to just go into the industry. And I don't think we do that well out here, and I don't know why, but that was a good segue into the next question um, is Do you think, what do you think Singapore can do to improve that overall, whether it's polytechnic? Adult learners or university, what do you think Singapore could help drive interest or that we're missing right now? Um, do you mean miss, missing what's the missing gap? Connecting the opportunities in all school or also driving potential interest in education as well for design. Okay, I can, I guess I can start. Uh, I think, I think, um. As educators, as education institutes, uh, our job is really not done after the students graduate from the school. Uh, that's my firm belief. And uh, in, in our private training institute, what we believe in is engaging the community and alumni. Uh, and tomorrow we are inviting all of them back uh, for an alum alumni night, and we have a series of events for them. So I think it's, it's Creating events like that, like the pop up campus, that really starts to bring them together uh, and foster networking opportunities for them to get new job opportunities, for them to mentor the next generation. So, I, I do believe you know, the gap is uh, we can do a lot more after they graduate and to engage uh, them in very, very meaningful ways to give back because I think many of them are. Um, I just want to share that the polytechnics are very hungry. They are very industry focused, right? So uh, we do try to come up with a lot of programs, um, you know, to engage industry. There's always hackathons and uh, even, you know, career guidance programs, even short second year mentorship, uh, apprenticeship programs where you know we invite companies to uh, get a few second year students to expose themselves to the industry even create portfolios from the get go and from first year to all the way to third year to that involves industry engagement uh, every step of the way uh, even our um we have industry mentorship as well as internship i think um what, what we need is more companies to come forward, you know. And um, I think the idea of uh, engagement doesn't have to be always uh, in a classroom. It's workplace, you know, field trips or projects, um, mini projects. It can be embedded into the curriculum. We would like to invite industry to work with the uh, polytechnics to um, help co-create the curriculum. And that's quite interesting. Um, you know, when you actually inside a curriculum, it's already you have industry projects. That's authentic, and the kids can create their own portfolio while learning. I think that's a, that's the strategy that most bodies are taking.
Yeah, I think anything. Um, I I think the kids also need to learn how to network. Our Singaporean kids. Um, sorry, I if any um, I don't know. I'm I'm coming speaking from a lecturer's perspective as well. Um, and we also our kids recently our US kids recently did a survey a uh, research. Uh, on graduates, fresh graduates, what their difficulties, their challenges. And they all say, we're all comfortable networking online, but we're not comfortable networking physically. And I think that we need to, we need to give them the confidence. And as often as possible, the exposure. So that's what I think networking is really important. It's interesting, so I'm, I'm listening to Amida, what you're saying, and I think on the A you talk to them in the comments in that respect. And I, I, think, I think the process has started. As so you know, we introduced this work study um, you know, program where, where students gain credits by working at the institutions, but also coming from an industry standpoint. So I, if I put my hat on, I would ask back, why would I want to partner with a university or a pod, what's in it for me? What am I getting in return? Because, okay, out of my good heart, right, I dedicate a few hours of, of my of my team, especially with, usually on their own dime and own time, they would, they would work with, with the students. But what is it in it there for for me? So SMU uh, has a program named SMU X. It's an experiential learning program. I know I'm teaching an MBA, uh, design thinking course on that. Where we partner up with um, with clients uh, to to their their real needs. But I find that the program is where the instructor puts in his or her expertise as a value offer towards the towards the the, the industry groups tend to perform better because my 10, 15 years of industry experience is helpful, hopefully, for those companies who need some additional manpower and thinking. And I need to do better as, a, as an educator to then leverage my students who don't have that expertise, but guide them in a way that they are being, that they be able to value offer back to the companies. So my perspective is, yes, the companies need to come forward, but I think we as, as educators also need to put ourselves more into, into their active role to, to be Actually, the challenge comes from all of us lecturers' I think so, because we're not just lecturers, but we need to be also domain expertise, like the domain experts, you know? That's, that's uh, really important. I always continuously sharpen the skills as the whole profession. I love that. I love, uh, I love all these answers, by the way. This is great. Um, so, related. In a way, um, maybe maybe related to the folks that either graduate or are transitioning as adult learners, how have you dealt with the stigma that designers uh, or career transitionals you know transition to design and they're not seen as you know valuable or don't have five years of experience in stigma, all right, and they just graduated maybe at, like a year in or they're career transitioning and for whatever reason they're not seen as valuable. How do you deal with that as educators or, you know, giving that advice to the learners as well, their career transitioning. So as an educator or as even a mentor, how do you help those folks as well? Yeah, uh, the mic's not working, but um, I think for, um, on the question itself, I think it, it will do treat that uh, on a couple of fronts, right? So number one, uh, we prepare them as much as possible from a skills perspective. So we're talking about hard skills over here. Um, and of course, um, in some cases, we can't expect someone to be a great visual designer, right? In just a couple of months going through a program. Uh, there, there are just some things you can sort of like fit over over like a very short period of time, you do need practice in order to get very, very good at it. Uh, but we, we try 
try and shock up, try and tell them, you know, these are the important things to look out for uh, in order for them to sound like someone who has been practicing in the industry for at least one or two years. Uh, and it is also through their own reflection and learning that they uh, are able to synthesize uh, whatever is learned and able to kind of like internalize all that that is done. Um, I think the secret really to how we create an accelerator program uh, is feedback, right? And when we look at a traditional program that uh, it's, it's kind of extended, there's a lot of breaks in between. So what we try and do is that we give as much feedback during the program as possible. We get feedback from their peers, they get feedback from their instructors, they get feedback from the industry. Um, so with all this feedback, they are able to improve and iteration to become even better at what they do. Um, so that's that's the, the other pillar that, that we look at. And, and last of all, it's it's really psychological. Um, it's about resilience and that positive mental attitude because it can be very discouraging to get rejections, uh, for sure. It almost feels like a personal attack on your own personal identity uh, because you get rejected a lot. So I think we try and um, uh, share with them that this is like all part of the process. You know, rejection is very natural um, and it's very competitive as well, right? The bar is getting higher. So we do um, try and share with them like, you know, what's the appropriate mindset, right? Like every rejection is probably getting you closer to success. Right. So this is kind of like a positive thinking thing, uh, but I think it does help uh, ideas a little bit because I think uh, they, if you don't feel confident being in the interview room talking to the prospective employers and feel confident of selling themselves as a UX designer, for example, um, then the, the employer is not going to buy it. They're not going to buy that this person can do the job. Yeah, so that's my perspective. I think um, I mean, coming from the school's perspective, we always try to help our kids. So um, portfolio is always, portfolio building is always important. So um, we actually have a portfolio module, de you know, development module where, you know, they build up their stuff. They, the minute they come in, you, you start a LinkedIn account. You get a triple or Behance website, you know, account. And you put your work there. And um, we, you know, we even give them uh, self-directed living resources. How to sell yourself, how to brand yourself. I think we've given as much resources as we can for them to, you know, be, be you know, to get there and to get that job, build that portfolio, have confidence. I think it's most importantly is the confidence, uh, confidence building. And um, we've also got work study programs that they can continue from internship. It really is up to the team, the, the student, the graduate, to take and seize that opportunity and ride with it. Because if you're not bold, if you're not brave, you know you're gonna just lose out. Take it, it's an adventure. Yeah. Um, I, I love what you said, and if you don't mind, I might steal this portfolio building that module right here, because I think it's great. <clears throat> and again, we, you just have a lot to learn from, from our colleagues here. Um, yeah, I, I, it again comes back to the individual responsibility of the educators as well. And while I agree, you cannot force a student to go out there and go grab the opportunity. For those who want, you really need to take your time. Right? I, I open up my calendar and Calendly, and, and I don't know what's happening. But just today, I had you know, two classes and then two career. And almost every day I have multiple of these mentoring conversations with the students individually. So I think we need to put ourselves out there. We need to leverage our own uh, you know, connections to help our students reach their goals because they don't know that until they, they see it. And another thing that, that I want to mention is that at least at the university level, um, I am irritated by grades and grading. Uh, I don't like grading and I, I don't like grades. Uh, so it's, it's a terrible combination to be a university professor with that. But what I'm trying to do is all this I'm 
questions today on direct portfolio pieces. Right? Today, the class is on heuristic evaluations. So the students learn how to do heuristic evaluations, they do heuristic evaluations, and then they immediately put it on their portfolios. <clears throat> There's no, no assignment in any of the design classes at SMU that doesn't go directly into your portfolio. So start building that portfolio. I think just to add, especially when you force a bell curve for a grading, that, that's very bad. <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to go ahead. I just, just want to add, I think it's, it's, it's an educator's way. Right? It's really about it's designing the lesson, designing the learning experience that will benefit the kids as well. So, so that's also important. Actually, that's a great segue <laughs> to the next question. <laughs> what do you think uh, the curriculum in Singapore could do better? Or what do you think has to be better? <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, mean, I was referring to some of this in my, uh, in my sharing about the, the patchiness. So at SMU, we don't have actually a, a program where you get a, a nice certificate that says you, 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 you learned all these UX skills or design thinking skills. Right? We don't even have a, a program. We have a, a, the latest data design and communication track for the business students to take that guides sort of the courses they should, they should take that includes data science, that includes some, some design thinking, that includes some UX courses, but, but it's, not, it's patchy and best. And other universities have the same problem as well. They offer design thinking electives that you may take, and it's nice because you learn all the flashy words, but how does that integrate into a holistic understanding of what design really needs? The, the, our friends from the place of making, the object making, all that other disciplines of design, you know, we just simply don't have the time to put it into a single elective. So what I think we need is move design 2.0 into design 3.0 into the multidisciplinary, interdisciplinary, and eventually into the transdisciplinary uh, place where designers and non-designers get to work together uh, on this. And, and, and without a holistic curriculum, this is not going to happen. I couldn't agree. And I think, you know what? We should start here by being advocates of such things. Because I think, um, you know, coming from the, the creative arts school, right? Um, until I read the, uh, until I was involved in this uh, design education advisory committee, I realized suddenly my, it is like seeing the epiphany, right, in light, right, that actually the creative arts is really uh, experiential designers. Um, I could see the relevance of my games design, I could see the relevance of how foundational design is to each and every one of my diplomas. So the I the, the bill has been lifted. So if so if it takes people like us, right, the manage the management like us to make a bold decision to make this a foundational thing to spread across so that across the disciplines that, that foundational design module, design thinking module, you and, and they will see the kids will see that it applies to their specialization. That design is the blueprint, or design is a sensibility. You know, you need to apply this to whatever you do. Horizontal. Can you share a quick uh, anecdote that uh, in my two years of teaching at SMU, my, my favorite experience was um, last summer, um, I, I had an opportunity to collaborate with a colleague of mine at SGT. Right? And he's running a Master's of Innovation program, and I'm running my EMBA course for executives and like very, you know, to, to teach them some design thinking. And we thought to each other, the SUTD folks, they couldn't go on an overseas trip, so they came all the way down to Bras Basel from Al Chengi. So, you know, that was nearly overseas experience for them. Uh, and we put them together. And the reason why it was my favorite experience, because the SUTD folks were all engineers. Okay, engineering master students, and I had a bunch of executives with you know business executives with over 15 years of work experience in the workplace, and they hated it. The entire week, they hated it. 
because the engineers don't have the language to talk to the, the business folks, and the business folks think that the engineers are just slackers who like play around in their computers. Like literally, that was the experience. But it was for us looking at it from an outside and, and the, from the management side, it was beautiful. That clash of, of these different disciplines was actually beautiful and they came out from this experience, I think, being better and better prepared for those conversations at the workplace that will inevitably be the I hate the engineers, I hate the management. Sorry. I think design is really, I think design is is, um, it's a, you need to change the mindset. Yeah. So for for us, when we think about how how do we address uh, the problem of the design, like training better designers for the industry, um, I think that's also that engagement with the industry. I I feel like a, um, maybe because us are growing at a very good pace, um, so. Men, um, they're, they're throwing a lot of money, they're, they're giving very good salary packages to our practitioners, and no one wants to leave a promising career uh, working for a high growth startup with equity compensation just to come and teach in the school. <laughs> right? So, like, no one wants to give up that good career. So, I think we need to be very creative as education institutes to engage the industry practitioners because it is essential uh, that this frontier knowledge gets uh, transmitted to the next generation of designers. So I, Jonas, you wanted to add? Okay, I, I think I think that's. Um, I would advocate paying more um, <laughs> for for our educators. Yes, uh, yes. yes, I definitely yes. would advocate for that. But I know, like generally, universities and polytechnics, they have and they have a certain cap. How much they, they would pay their educators. Um, but I think what we did or found creative ways around it is like, for example, like for Jay, we um, would get him to come in for a few guest lectures outside of working hours. And if needed, um, we, we asked him, hey, you know, can you just come and then we record a session and then like, we play it back in the classroom or something like that. So I, I, we try and find creative ways where I think. Some industry practitioners who are very passionate about giving back, um, they are they find it easy, right, to work with us as education institutes to to then like give back this knowledge and skills to the next generation. I wanna I wanna challenge something you said there. Yeah. Um, so uh, yes, more money for sure, but I am not at SMU to make money. It does not make sense. I took a great Netflix to work at, uh, at, at SMU, okay? I'm not here for the money. I'm here for the experience, and then I'm here to pay back to, to, to the community by training human-centered design professionals, especially product managers and product owners, to, to have that. I'm not here for money. And the reason why I wanted to push back a little bit on, on, on looking at from a money perspective, I was part of a, um, of a nonprofit uh, Educational gaming company back here in California, and it uh, was funded by the MacArthur and the Gates Foundation, it was called Glass Lab. And the mission of the organization was to bring education into the universe, right? Because we know that that's how we can capture the, the, the teenagers where they spend four times as much playing video games than in their homework. So let's bring the homework into video games. Uh, what was really interesting about that is we had. The opportunity of the world leading game designers. The, we worked with EA and we had the game designer head of Madden, the, the game, come and work for us for free. We had amazing you know, educators from Berkeley, Stanford, all of us come to work for us for peanuts. Okay? It's not the money, it's presenting that vision, presenting that passion that these folks need. To, to join the cause. So I don't think it's about the money primarily. Yes, you need to, uh, to, to make sure that you pay the rent, but they are there because they want to make a difference. I want to make a difference. That's why I joined and came back to it. So I think you just have to articulate the vision and articulate the mission and articulate that idea that there is a reason to come back to it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And I would say for context, Tomas also came in and helped support us <laughs> in the early days as well. Like I said, we need to be like I said, we need to be advocates. And we need to be advocates. Very, very good discussion here. I think, um, yeah, I've heard some great answers. I think this question is very interesting. How far has design and education come along in Singapore and Southeast Asia versus the West? What would it help elevate the bar in this region? What would help elevate the bar of education in this region? Dalen, right? Sure. Um, I, I would say we need to think about it from like two factors, like one, we need to think about skill and the other, we need to think about like engaging people who are on the work every single day and helping them translate whatever they're learning and whatever they're experiencing into something digestible for the learners. And I think educators are great at that. Like we're great listeners, we're, we're great at synthesizing something into uh, more manageable units uh, and explaining it in a very simple way to the industry, uh, to professionals, to adult learners, or to learners themselves. So um, unfortunately, at least I would say like for, for Singapore, there, there aren't many uh, in this pool. The, over the years it has increased, but there's still not many practitioners and we probably need more educators who are able to go down to the industry and, and take some of this frontier knowledge and skills and be able to like translate that into like a course or um, like modules or little book chunks. And then right, because there are just not as many, right? How many Tamasas are there? How many Jigs are there? <laughs> <laughs> like there are, there are not enough of them. That's that's the answer. And we need to scale it um, in in a way whereby, and then test and see actually are people still understanding. Uh, let's say they're watching the video of uh, Tomas presenting or Jay presenting. Like, do they still understand it? Um, so that's that's something we're experimenting on, like uh, asynchronous learning, as they call it, uh, and synchronous learning. I think we need to attack on all fronts um, to raise the bar, right? You need to also um, start from when you're young, you know, when you're young. So the education system needs to introduce the A in the STEM education, right? The C. So the, the design thinking can, can be introduced design education can be preschool. And when you have that, you develop generationally that, that that culture of design thinking in school in education from young you start thinking and you generate that creativity you are going to get a whole next generation of really creative design thinkers who will absorb this as a sensibility and absorb this into their specialization so it has to be really um, nation effort. I think I addressed most of those points. Okay. All right. Um, I guess the next question then, specifically for you, then, what has been the biggest culture shock for you in terms of education coming from America and then now teaching here in Singapore? So it's not food. Yeah. No. Not food. Okay. <laughs> um, so I. It was very interesting. I was warned by some of my friends coming here, right? Like, uh, you know, I, I was about to start my, uh, my, my position at SMU and I had these conversations with multiple of the folks telling me like, you know, Singaporean kids, like, they're not so creative. Like, I'll let you know what I was Or they, they don't have that like, spirit. And I was like, ooh, what did I sign up for? That was, I, I, I knew I wanted to be in that. So it's like let's let's find this out. So I went in with an open mindset, right? A designer, design thinking, open mindset of let's see what it, what, what we get. And I have to say, I fundamentally disagree with that characterization after two years, because it's a very ethnocentric viewpoint of a Westerner approach 
what creativity is and what willingness to learn is. And this is coming from a place of, of humility because, because I had the privilege to, to do my, my, you know, my postgraduate work at Stanford. I had the privilege to get a PhD from the UK. All institutions where before the class is in stars, before the professor can open their mouths, there are five hands in the air. I have a question for you. I read your paper. I disagree with that point. <laughs> you haven't even started the, the lecture, but that's what's happening, right? Like, go to San Francisco, right? Like, all those folks are eager and they push it out. And that's what we characterize as creativity. But that's an ethnocentric, very much a, a, a one sided view of what creativity is and what, what really uh, passion for learning is. I, I got to realize that the passion is inside of them, the folks here and, and the students I, I have the privilege to work with, but I have to approach it. I have to become uh, sure that they don't view me as this uh, you know, professor sitting on the, on the iron throne up there and flying with dragons, but it's somebody who's approachable. Yeah, and I started thinking, what is it that I can do? So I started every one of my class with a TikTok dance, okay? That, that literally to wake them up in the morning, especially if it's being university kids hard at 8 a.m. classes. So we do a TikTok dance where I put myself in a ridiculous position because I'm not a good dancer, folks. But uh, but I put it out there, I show the vulnerability. Because I think once they once you show them and once you can connect with them and, and offer to go for a beer, go for a coffee, then, then you can connect with them and you see the sparks. And I, I'm incredibly humbled by, by some of the creativity that I see in the students. So the culture shock was more of how Singapore and Singaporean education is labeled, and, and I'm more ashamed of it as, as, as I'm not really appreciating that prior to that. But I learned my lesson. Tomas, did I hear from you? You danced for your class? Yeah. Do you have a TikTok account? <laughs> yes, it's the dancing one. The dancing professor, TikTok, check it out. Awesome. All right. So this one got the most votes. Design thinking has become a buzzword and almost trendy that everybody wants to become a designer. What do you advise these folks entering into the field and why? Well, I think it's design thinking yes, is a buzzword. You know, um, I, I think I would encourage them to be true to yourself because you see the real world, the world needs always, almost always needs, uh, you are someone who can, or a designer, you, you need to approach it with um, good, we're designing for good. Um, and then from there, you know, what, how can I make the world a better place? How can I make this a joyful experience? I think it has to come, it's like a sense of mission. I think then you really can own it and, and yeah, I, I think that's the best starting point. And that's what I always tell my students. You be trained to be creative design professionals, but with a, with, who are passionate, but with a heart for the community. And that's what you're going out to do. And design does make a better place, but you have to, you cannot just be the mouthpiece and say, design thinking, this ID, this prototype, uh, do it. And, and, and for good. For good. Uh, yeah, I you know, totally agree with what you say, like go out there and, and, and show what you do. That, that's, a, that's a great way uh, to do that. Um, other thing, other ways that I, I like to counter that sort of, you know, flashy words and, you know, I do, I work at Stanford, uh, is actually like walk the talk, like show them that you're doing the, the stuff that you're talking about. So counter it with authenticity, mm -hmm. right? Like, like, like be that person who genuinely willing and accepts students' failures. So at least in my class, you can submit uh, an assignment and a final report that's a complete disaster and it's failed. You show me that you worked your butt off and it was really a genuine effort 
and it fails, you're going to get a really, really great instrument. So I think walking the talk counter all that buzzworthiness. Thank you. So I remember when I was 16 and I went to the Polytechnic here, at Nanyang Polytechnic. Um, I tried to encourage my friend from secondary school to join me in the design program. And uh, he went, he very much wanted to, and then he went back and he talked to his dad. And his dad said, are you crazy? Uh, you know, there's no future in design. <laughs> So I, I think for me at that time, point in time, I really wanted to do design because I didn't, didn't like exams. I, I didn't want to take any exams anymore. So I went to design school and, and grinded out for three years and started to understand and appreciate uh, design a lot more. And then after that, going to business school, I started to see very real applications of to make an impact. And I truly believe that design is a meta skill that everyone can and should acquire um, in their professional capacity to be better problem solvers. Yeah, so I, I think it's something everyone can learn. Um, of course, you don't have to learn it at such a deep level whereby you can, I don't know, come up with like very polished user interfaces or like graph or anything. It doesn't have to be that. Um, you can learn it at a level whereby you understand the process, you understand how to use it, uh, use the research, um, and, and think about your customers first, always, uh, and be more empathic, right? Um, I think those things are quite simple, and those things are actually quite natural to for most professionals. So uh, once you recognize that and um, implement that in the workplace, and you see like an actual remember teaching um, insurance executives in Malaysia for potential. Um, and after we went through like our two-day UX workshop, we were able to prototype in, in vision and then show the CEO a prototype of Envision. And this is a marketer. This is not a designer. <laughs> so the marketer showed the, the, the prototype to the CEO as a wireframe. It's like, oh, okay, now the CEO gets what's going on. Right. So I think it's it's a lot of these things that we learn in design can actually be applied in, in the business context. So uh, design thinking got a little bit of a bad rap because everyone talks about the process and, and, and says, hey, this is what you do from step one to step ten. But then I, I don't think there's enough of that contextualization. So I, I think that's where, as educators, we try and like, push the bar a little bit. Yeah. All right. So because I, I know there's another question that has most quotes, but this is like a little bit related. So not everyone's going to be a successful designer, right? Uh, and it's true for adult learners, career learners, or people that graduate. Um, how do you give guidance in these times of struggle? Because, you know, the folks I graduated with, they're not designers anymore, some of them, or they just gave up and went to another industry, or it took them maybe like five, ten years and they finally made it, right? So how do you guidance these folks as students that just graduated from high school, uni, or even adult transitioners? I, I don't want to preach. So <laughs> maybe I'll let the others you know, <laughs> I need to vomit in my Oh my god. <laughs> I'm happy to. So I actually real story. I just got a, a message on me. Yesterday. One, one of my uh, alumni, one of the students who graduated in the, from SMU since, and, and uh, was so proud. He got an internship, I'm not going to say where, uh, not ever, uh, I'm not going to say where, and uh, design, he's a product designer. That was his dream. That was his dream. Um, and he went through the internship with flying colors, everyone loved his work, and they offered him a full time job, right? He. Uh, one month after starting his full-time product designer job that was his dream, uh, he got laid off. It was a company-wide lay layoffs that impacted him. He wrote this very heartfelt message on LinkedIn and reached out to me as well, so if you like a coffee or a beer, it's better, um, of, of 
Can you say some sort of what, what now? Now what? Right? Like what's the what, what what's the app then? And I think uh, I think the only thing I can tell them over email and, and, and we'll we'll be facing this. It's, it's still formulating in my head, but I think I'm going to say to him like, listen, buddy, you're I know you're an incredibly high potential um, designer, and you have. You, you have a second chance, even if you don't see it now. And, and I, I genuinely believe that you will make a, a really, really powerful career out of it. But it's my responsibility and everyone's around him's responsibility to, to remind him that design is about continuous failures and iterations. And, and designing your career is the same, uh, same process as designing a product or a service. Right? It's the old joke, and the psychologist I trained with, the old joke says that the psychologist, right, goes to his friend and says, oh, listen, I, I, you know, I have a really big problem in my life. And then, and then the friend says, oh, just apply your methodology. And then the guy says, oh, don't joke about it, this is my real life. So this is exactly what we need to do. We, we need to model the behavior of constant failure. So I'm looking forward to what is this hard conversation. And, then, and if you know a... Uh, an opening for a, a junior product designer, please come to me because uh, I have one of the amazing, amazing people. I think, uh, okay, I've, uh, we've got, I've got, I've read of some kids who uh, really sucked, you know, didn't, uh, didn't get the diploma, right, in the end, didn't complete or uh, fail after three modules and then were dismissed, you know. But uh, a few years down the road, a few years down the road, they are successes. So I asked them, what's your, what's your success, you know? Um, they revisited their dream. They never gave up. So I think it's important that um, uh, you, can, you can put it one side, but you can revisit again. It's not a, the, the, the road is not closed, you know? And which is why we, it's, I, I, I was cautious about I, I was cautious that the kids will stick to a one-stop plan and then that's it. You know, like, oh, I feel like getting a job as a, as a graphic designer and I'm not going to pursue that. I'm going to insurance instead. This is the plight of so many of our kids and we call it the job leakage. You know, we, 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 we track this when students uh, um, don't, don't, don't start a career because they gave it up, they can't even find a job. But uh, we're teaching them how to design your life. We're teaching them, hey, give yourself three options. Make the Odyssey plan, right? Have yourself some backup. But the exercise help, helps them to entertain options that they can, you know, uh, ways and needs, or they can revisit that again to never give up, I think. So, so the success stories, and we get our elements to come back to inspire the kids. As educators, we can only do so much. So I think what the media says is really reminds me of a quote that I often share with the students, like what is delayed is not denied, right? Just because there's some delays, just because there's some barriers doesn't mean that the opportunity is completely denied. Uh, I think it's definitely worth trying. Um, I would say that, like when we look at you specifically for UX design or any career in the tech industry, there's like no one job description or no one size, right? Even if we say something like a UX designer, there are UX designers who specialize more on the visual design, and some specialize more on the research side, some specialize more on the content side. And for students who are coming from a business background, people who are coming from a more um, you know, like business related background, uh, I say, hey, you know, don't, don't do that uh, just because you've not gone to design school. Like, actually, you have some really important skills that you can still apply as, as a designer. In fact, you can be what we call a UX consultant, right? And consulting firms are actually hiring a lot of um, design thinkers. Um, some call them business designer, some call them like design consultants, and they apply exactly the same process to facilitate workshops for enterprise clients. Um, and we have agencies who also 
need such talent, uh, and they don't need someone who has that um, depth in visual design. They might need someone. You could even join a startup where uh, the startups require people who know a little bit of everything. Like just now earlier at the career consultation booth, I was talking to someone who was in performance marketing and say. Actually, you know, you shouldn't have to struggle so much to enter the tech industry because you have the necessary prerequisite. Uh, you've done A-B testing, right? You understand the language of how to build digital products in a very iterative fashion. So um, th there's no one path. Like, why, why do you want to sell yourself as like a generic UX designer <laughs> that, that can do projects? Yeah. Awesome. I think we are out of time. So thank you again for these amazing answers from trying to figure out how to improve the Singapore design curriculum to giving advice to struggling designers or even encouraging designers to get into the field. Any final words aside before we close this out, this session out? Mm, I think I think it's important that you find the people who believe in you and to actually work with them. Uh, and and I would believe that the world is supportive and kind and you need good people around who want to support you in, in your endeavors, right? So whether it's mentors, and, uh, but you need to have the courage to first reach out to them and make a request. So that's, that's my final words. I think, um... The, the, the lack of a designer is not a solo one. Uh, a lot of fresh graduates start up thinking it is. But actually, uh, learn the value of collaboration um, and, and, and cherish the, the, the kind of teamwork that you actually, teamwork dynamics you actually foster the different teams. I tell you, one day you come back and you either, you either keep working with them or you revisit them again and then you always come back to each other. The, the, the whole cycle will repeat again where a good teamwork will always be your, um, will always make everything uh, better. I think learn the art of collaboration. It's not a cycle. It's hard to give that great message, I think. Um, just one thing to remind yourself that just because you're, you finally get to design diploma or a design degree, you, you, you've never stopped learning. That journey never really stops. So if, you, if you're looking for a pat on the shoulder and you're looking to be called a designer, good for you, but that doesn't stop there. So my sort of closing idea is that don't just think for, I'm gonna work until I get that piece of paper, but that's where the journey just starts. Awesome. Awesome. I think my takeaway from that is always network. Uh, wherever you are, and it's the perfect week to network, especially with the start of design week, uh, and you have another day of curious to work, right? So uh, definitely keep networking, especially if you're a young designer, uh, or even uh, adult learner, I think networking will definitely help you out, along with the advice that was given from our amazing panelists. So thank you all for joining us here today. Thank you to the audience for being here. I know it's really tough with the traffic, and it's Friday night. Uh, thank you to the sponsors as well, sponsoring this amazing session. So uh, really appreciate everyone coming out tonight. Uh, if you want to talk to us uh, after the session, feel free to stay around. I know you have to go. But thank you again, everybody, for joining us for tonight. Uh, take care. Good night. Thank you, Dave.